discussion over dinner. This is our home. I came to listen to you, to talk with you. Discussion over dinner is sponsored and underwritten by State Street Community Church and the Pack Center. Welcome to December's discussion over dessert. Today we've got a panelist full of people to talk about economic development in the city of Laporte and Laporte County, things like that. And uh, we next month will be back with live events. Uh, for the next three months actually in January, February, March. We will have live discussion over dinners where we have a meal and different panelists and things like that. But this is still a private one uh, with panelists that uh, work for the city of Laporte and also work for the Greater uh, Laporte Economic uh, Development Corporation. That's a mouthful. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to him right now so that we can get into a good conversation about um, how Laporte can continue to develop economically, but also just to be a city in the 21st century that continues to evolve um, to grow. So uh, let me introduce the panelists today. He is the engineer for the city of Laporte. His expertise is in community, municipal, and civil engineering projects. He launched an innovative pavement management system that allowed the city to maximize limited funds towards paving. Under his leadership, Laporte was the first city in Indiana to win a federal grant for pavement maintenance based on an improved asset management system. He's a Valparaiso University and University of Colorado, uh, Colorado graduate, but was born and raised in La Porte. I'm glad to have with us today my friend, Nick Minnick. And then she is the Director of Community Development and Planning for the City of La Porte. She serves as the Administrator for the, development, or the Redevelopment Commission, the Historic Preservation Commission, the Business Improvement District, and the Design Standards Committees. She also, if that wasn't enough, serves as staff for the Board of Zoning Appeals and the Plan Commission, manages tax abatements, and works on many fun special projects throughout the city. She's a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, Go Irish, and Ball State University, Chirp Chirp. I'm glad to have with us today Beth Schrader. And finally, last but not least, he's the Executive, executive Director of the Greater Laporte Economic Development Corporation. His past experience has been with the Portage Economic Development Corporation as their executive director and with the LaPorte County Economic Development Alliance as retention and expansion coordinator. He sits on a number of boards and commissions, including, but not limited to, the LaPorte Urban Enterprise Association, the LaPorte Chamber of Commerce, the Regional Development Company, the LaPorte County Revolving Loan Fund, and the Northwest Indiana Forum's Economic Development Committee. He's a graduate of Purdue University Northwest. I'm glad to have Bert Cook with us today. Hello guys, how are you? Nicholas, how are you doing? Uh, very well, thank you. <laughs> hey, uh, can we talk about the thing that you just went to or no? Uh, it yeah, it, it was announced. Yeah, yeah go ahead and announce. We got, got an email, break, so break, Breaking news of what, um, what you guys just did the today. City of Laporte did receive a grant from Indiana Department of Transportation. Uh, we were in Gary earlier today to accept that from the governor. Uh, it's, it's a little over a $6 million grant, and it's to uh, do grade separation, which is basically put an overpass. Uh, the project we have earmarked for that is at Tipton Street, so we have some issues with kind of reliability, and then we have some safety issues when you have uh, such a busy railroad running right through the middle of your city. So this is going to give us the opportunity to have uh, an another means to get from north to south. and and you're not going to be stopping at tracks when it's built. So. Well, what's your estimated timeline of build on this? So the local tracks program is, is what the grant is, and uh, they, they want every project under construction within four years. So it's, a, it's kind of a fast track program. It's all state money, which makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to maneuver. And um, they're, they're looking at, like I said, within four years or sooner for all these projects. 
So that's what they're looking at. What are you looking at? Well, sooner than that, <laughs> as soon as possible. You're, 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 you're on video now, yeah. you're on the podcast, yeah. so I, I get to actually press you on some of those projects, okay. all the things that I really care about. Um, so, uh, Bert, I got a question for you. Um, so, economic development is one of your you know, specialties. Uh, I read a, uh, an op-ed that you wrote in uh, buildingindiana.com, and you said, today's world is far different. The jobs are no longer the only deciding factor. This uh, generation decides where they want to live and then looks for work accordingly. It's a simple change, but one with far-reaching implications. Quality of life or placemaking has become an industry all its own. What do you mean by that? So I think, Nate, the, the, when I started in economic development, and I'm not that old, but let's say you know, for over the last 15 years, there's been a, a dramatic shift from, you know, originally uh, we were, we were um, under the impression that if, if, you, if you just focused on creating good, high-paying jobs, that everything else would take care of itself. And so all of, or most of your economic development groups were charged with focusing on industrial development um, and, and creating the type of jobs that, that you know, pay good wages and, and, um, and that was our focus. Well, so just bringing in like commercial and like manufacturing type of thing? Correct, or? yeah, and manufacturing is the, is the easy, right, is the yep. easy um, answer to that. Now what has changed, and that's been over the last, you know, 10 to 12 years, is people now, don't decide where they live by their job. They, they, they first pick a location that they want to be and then they find a job accordingly. So it used to be, again, all we do is create those jobs and that will take care of drawing the people in and helping us grow our community. Now it's a, it's a completely different dynamic and you have to focus on creating a space that people want to live and in turn that, that attracts those people but it also brings in the jobs uh, as well because it, let's face it, employers want to be where their potential workforce is. So a lot of what we'll talk about in economic development terms are different than what you would have heard in the 80s and even the 90s because placemaking or creating these spaces where people choose to live is now a major component of what we would call traditional economic development. Yeah, and we're, we're here at State Street and Pax and are passionate about placemaking. It's why our Brighton Street green space and Jack, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Jackson Street uh, is so important to us. But tell me though, Bert, like, so you, you've, got, you've got all these economic drivers, but that sounds like it's more economic development as an investment than in that you're trying to build things that um, matter to people for location purposes, right? So you're, you're trying to, to, to build a city that's fun to live in. Right. It, right, it becomes much more multifaceted. So as opposed to being, you know, focused in one very, very tight area, I think you you're forced to focus in many different areas because, you know, when you talk about quality of place or place making, that means something different to to everybody. So we may, you know, have completely different opinions of what um, place making means. So you'll talk. Some people will talk about uh, parks and and recreational opportunities. Others will talk about school system. Others will talk about retail, where they can shop or where they're the restaurants that they like. Um, so there's a whole wide variety of things that are important to people. And so you have to start to focus in on all of those different areas. It can't just be, well, let's look for the next industrial client um, that's going to create 300 jobs because ultimately that may, that may not make, have the impact that you're, that you're hoping for. So we're very lucky in the port because you know the, the two people on my right and left are, uh, I think, very very bright and, and and creative when it comes to looking at this community and figuring out ways that we can add to what we already have here um, and create these quality of life or quality of place amenities that people are so desirous of right now. Uh, Beth, yeah, uh, the three of you guys work together on lots of different projects and things like that, though. Uh, Bert isn't working for the city like you guys do, but it is kind of involved. H how does the nature of your guys' relationship work? What is it, I mean, do you guys just get together and scheme on projects? How, how, how does it work? How does economic development work as an actual strategy? Well, um, I think that we, we do work well as a team, which uh, is, is really important. As far as the, the way a project would come in, um, 
usually uh, Bert is kind of the the greeter. So he, he will make the first contact um, and kind of set things up. And once we're at a stage where uh, we're ready to, to move on to maybe something being constructed, um, that's when it kind of transitions from Gledsey over to city departments. And that's where Nick and I would kind of take over. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to talk a little bit about so we live in a, uh, a city that was formerly dominated, like a lot of Rust Belt cities, was formerly dominated by um, industry like um, uh, all those Chalmers and things like that. And uh, any city like ours in the Rust Belt that doesn't have corporations of two or 3,000 people with big footprints in their cities and things like that is looking at redeveloping that space. Because typically they're in good spaces, they're downtown, you know, they, they um, are in spaces that you don't want to drive much. Nick, can you explain a little bit what a brownfield site is mm -hmm. and why the government and different municipalities are trying to focus so much on redeveloping those? Sure. So I, I think when you talk about brownfield, you're really talking about what isn't a greenfield. So a greenfield would be a site that has never seen development. Um, we for a long time, our pattern de of development was always, you know, push to the outskirts, push to the outskirts, push to the outskirts. Um, but that that doesn't work as well, and it doesn't really work well for the city of Laporte, who is kind of constricted by, you know, where are the boundaries of the city? And um, if we just continue to grow out, 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 we're we're you know we're taking over farmland, which is another unique aspect of our county. We're do we're doing all these things that isn't necessarily conducive to the character of our community. Um, so what we have is an opportunity in a brownfield. Um, brownfields are really sites that are underutilized. Uh, they're sites that potentially have contamination, um, but a brownfield would be defined as anything with even a perception of contamination. So uh, when, say, Alice Chalmers was in Laporte, they wanted to be in the middle of town because in the middle of town was where all their workers could get for employment. They wanted to be close to railroad tracks. They wanted to be, you know, close to the amenities that we now value for for different reasons. Um, so really, I like I like brownfields. I've been interested in them for a very long time. I've I've geared a lot of my education prior to uh, even entering the professional world towards brownfield redevelopment. And one of the biggest reasons is you get to see a change in something that's underutilized to become something that's utilized. And and the other thing is. Um, it, it's almost like a preservation of opportunity. So we had an opportunity through the early 1900s and up until about the 70s or 80s in factory workers in, in the middle of our city. Well now that's shifted and now we have an opportunity to create something different, kind of an extension of our downtown. Uh, and, and the brownfield that is the former Alice Chalmers complex is that opportunity. So it's almost created a, a place that's preserved for us to, to look at how does our, our community grow into the future and it kind of linked to what it was in the past. So there's a lot of levels to it and um, I think it's really interesting to to look at the opportunities um, from that perspective of both what it was and what it could be. Are there any projects locally in near, nearby communities that you think have done a great job with redeveloping brownfields that you look to and say okay they're a great model for how to do that. So we, we continue to see more and more brownfield redevelopment in the region. But um, throughout Northwest Indiana, what you've seen for a long time has been pushing to the outskirts. So you've seen places like Crown Point and Valpo grow and grow and grow. Well, those communities had more greenfield sites. Um, as, as those communities grow, that there's another opportunity to look back into the communities that didn't necessarily have as much greenfield development. Um, so I can't point to kind of specific within the region as far as, you know, this was a great brownfield mm -hmm. project that created something unique. Um, what about at the Hammond waterfront? That, that's a great one. And that's, that's a little different. Well, it has some similarities. But so there was a, a project at, um, they call it Lakefront Park in Portage. It's National Park property. And um, they took a brownfield, which um, was pretty disgusting if you acid pools acid pools and, uh, and orange sand stuff. and all kinds of stuff and they converted that into a lakefront park um, 
so that was a redevelop R RDA redevelopment authority um, grant that did a lot of the work. It was in coordination with the city of Portage and, and with U.S. Steel um, and the National Park Service. And the National Park Service. So it was a lot of a lot of partners came together to uh, take take something that was a potential asset, but had had been you know kind of overutilized for industrial purposes, and and flip that to become a uh, kind of a natural amenity and asset for the communities. And the biodiversity in that particular park has. Uh, I think exceeded everyone's expectations as far as recovery. So, you know, you a place where there were acid pools, and now you're seeing species that are, uh, you know, threatened or endangered. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, I know that it's, you know, a real jewel. And then another project that uh, Nick and I worked on. Uh, when we were with uh, an engineering firm, uh, Hammond, um, the lakefront park there, they have a pavilion, and they've done a lot of uh, development with their, uh, I think her, their port authority funding a lot of that, but those were definitely brownfield sites. Um, where so it sounds like Hammond's doing some really good things with brownfield. And yeah, it, and it, yeah. a lot of the sites that you've seen redeveloped from a brownfield perspective are um, kind of the low-hanging fruit, which would be like lakefront, park amenities up until now. So um, the both Hammond and Portage became parks. Uh, I think one kind of unique difference is we're looking, one, to regain some of the natural capital that was lost when um, Clear Lake was taken over by industry, but uh, at the same time, we're, we're, not, we're not tipping the balance so far that we're uh, just trying to do a wholesale, create a, create a park here, but we're trying to um, bring other things in too. I assume a lot of what uh, South Bend is doing with their Studebaker area was that a brownfield as well. Yes. Or, yeah. Yep. So and they're yep. really, I think, trying to focus a lot of yep. attention and energy. Yeah. And Michigan City has a lot of brownfield projects that they're kind of starting to ramp up. They received a grant about a year ago. So. So Beth, what? Why? Wh what's the biggest challenges to redeveloping brownfield? Is it just it costs a lot more money than going to a greenfield? Or I think that's the main issue. And then there's a issue of perception too, uh, which we've run into in Laporte. Um, everyone remembers what it was. A lot of people uh, know what was dumped. Um, and so those are all things that you have to uh, communicate to everyone, how things get cleaned up, and then to what level too. So the big difference between the projects that we were just talking about where Nick was explaining how they were turned into parks, um, that's uh, kind of a lower threshold of cleanup that has to be done for that type of use. Um, when you're doing a more intensive redevelopment for a commercial building or for a residential, um, the types of things that we want to do because that's what makes sense for our community. Um, although there's a lot of recreational components that are planned for Newport Landing, um, there's more expense and more uh, time and effort involved in uh, preparing those sites for development. Uh, end use is a really big thing with brownfield redevelopment. If you have no end use in mind, you don't know what you need to do to prepare the site for that end use. So in our case, we're looking at primarily a commercial development with some residential components. The areas that are commercial don't necessarily need to have everything at the site removed and clean material brought in and creating a, a greenfield site because people don't access the site in, in that way. Um, where you have people living and, and residents, you will want to do some other things to make sure that it's that the kind of the, the chemicals that are left over from in industry are at a level that are safe for people to, to interact with on a regular basis. I think you should point out too that it would be fiscally irresponsible for a community to just spend money without an end use in mind. I mean, that's that's part of why the plan has to be put in place in order to understand what the cost is to utilize that property in a certain way. I mean, I guess maybe communities out there would would uh, in an ideal world you'd have money would be no option and you could just do you could clean anything up at any cost. But in the real world. You know, we have to make every dollar count, and so you have to put those resources uh, to work for you. And in order to do that uh, in a fiscally responsible way, you need to understand what the end use is going to be before you start that process. It would not be fiscally responsible to just take and remove everything from any site that ever had industrial activity on it. I mean, that's just not that's not a reasonable 
use of, of funds. Um, you'd be spending a lot of money to just move material to another site somewhere else and, and you wouldn't be gaining anything from, a, from an economic or community development standpoint because the site would still be used for, you know, if, if ultimately it's commercial and you know it's going to be commercial, it's going to be used for commercial. So going ahead and, and making it a pristine greenfield site as if it were not in a former industrial area um, would cost a whole lot of money and you would see no additional benefit to the community from that. So can we talk, since we're on Newport kind of a little bit, can we talk a little bit about logistics? So let's say, um, and I think we can all assume, you know, 90 years ago when all those Chalmers is growing in there, Rumley or whatever company it was at the time, did not abide by today's standards of environmental regulations. So you have dirty ground, you have yeah. things like this. So what, what are some of the things you had to do in Newport Landing to mitigate the site and to make it, you know, uh, able to be built on. Sure. So um, what we have done is essentially what we call the Pine Lake Ave parcels and the part of the Verma parcel, and those are the the names of the kind of properties or previous owners. Um, the big open space that you see in the middle of our Newport Landing development, we always intended that to be a commercial use. So what was on top of that, in in a way preserving it was um, you know, between two and four feet of concrete with a building on it. So when you remove that concrete and all the concrete was tested, all the soil was tested, everything was tested, when you remove the concrete, what's left is, is what um, an environmental, co environmental consultant would consider urban fill. So all that material is fill. Uh, material was brought in from wherever they could find it in the early 1900s. It filled in what Clear Lake used to extend to Lily Lake, they were connected. So um, when you start sampling the ground, you find that there may be pockets of material that was maybe used in a foundry or used somewhere else. So you may see elevated levels of, of you know, a lead or a mercury. So Nick, if I'm, it's, sorry to interrupt. So what you're saying then is some of the soil there isn't even contaminated from all those Chalmers. It may have been brought in contaminated already no, when they filled? Correct. The first phase, uh, we don't see any locations that were actually contaminated from the activities at Alice Chalmers. Okay. Um, the, the cleanup of Alice Chalmers was really when they removed the buildings, they had to remove of asbestos containing material. Um, and then once you had the building foundations there, what you're seeing is soil that was from a number of different sources and some of it had you know, elevated levels of something in it but nothing that um, would preclude it from commercial development. So the bulk of the cleanup for the, the first part was uh, removal of the buildings, removal of the building foundations, and then providing a clean sand cap over it, which would allow for um, you know, less interaction with the material below. Mm -hmm. um, that material was sampled for years and years and years, and we have a lot of analytical data um, letting us know what is there and, and where it is. And you know, because of that, IDEM has issued us a, a site status letter. A site status letter is essentially a, um, a regulatory closure document saying this, this is what is at the site, we know it's there, and this is what you can potentially use the site for. And that's commercial is what we could use that site for. So beforehand, we had lots of years of people working on this ground. Um, and like you said, as a son of a concrete guy, concrete closes things pretty well. Yeah. So, uh, <coughs> so the concrete was closing it in there, whatever contaminant it was. Um, so it's essentially, is that what you do again, is you put a parking lot over it and then, you know? A parking lot, a building, pretty much anything. And, and really, the, the soil is not in bad condition. It's the same soil that was brought in to literally build everything in Laporte. It's not any different than any other building in Laporte was built on. It's what was it's brought what in to build on Walmart and you know whenever these things were built. It, it's yep. what was available when they were constructing the and, factories. And outside of Laporte too. I mean this is something that you see definitely throughout Northwest Indiana, um, probably throughout the Rust Belt and the nation in urban places. Mm -hmm. And I think um, when we talk about that material and, and what's, what's brought in, um, I think it is important, like you said, Alice Chalmers wasn't 
dumping things in that area we know that there's a location where they were disposing of paint waste and we have a plan in order to clean up that paint waste so we we know each area of newport landing because it's been sampled so much and we know how to make sure that those areas are cleaned to the appropriate level for whatever the end use is and, and, and again I, based on my own experience my dad's owned some land and things like this and i know for us whenever we sell land you've got to get it bored and things like that mm -hmm. um and sometimes it can be just a very small one area of a piece of land that has, you know, a mm -hmm. very minimal, but, you know, it's in your environmental report, but it could just be one little area, correct? I mean, yes. it doesn't, yeah. that doesn't mean that's in, especially, I assume, with how they backfilled that land over time. Um, yeah. Okay. So then, do you have anything, Beth? Or well, just the, the consultant that we've been working with on what we call phase two, which is, uh, kind of the area that hasn't been uh, no cleanup activities have started on it's between kind of the open field right now and the shore of Clear Lake um, they they created really terrific maps because they made uh, they did borings so mm -hmm. soil samples at very regular intervals so that they can show you um, uh, you know a map of what you know 20 feet under the soil looks like and and you so can see where uh, historically things have been uh, you know put here there um, and so we just have a very good understanding of what is where and what we need to do to clean it up the right way and, and again there's not a lot of reason to go forward with cleanup until we have an end use and we we did have the Flaherty project announced um, over the summer and uh, so what was the Flaherty project? I'll let, I'll let yeah we'll get we'll get into projects <laughs> in a second but yeah um, so now that we have an end use for that we've been working with our consultant and we'll be bidding out the cleanup work uh, within the next few months and that cleanup work will go to until about the early summer and then um, at that point we'll have all of our confirmation sampling and they'll be able to move forward with construction so so then you have to get another approval from um, IDEM or who do you get so we have a site status letter for the first phase um, which is the center the center piece and we will get the same letter for the second okay. phase once the work is completed okay because you you prioritize that first piece yeah so in the first the first piece was a little bit it was kind of low-hanging fruit in that um, the the property was really in good condition for commercial development uh -huh. as it was yep. uh, when we start talking about the Flaherty project which is a residential project we have to do more on on the next phase in order to get it to a level that IDEM would would be okay with for residential and Nick when, when do you when does the city I, does the city do the work for that for Flaherty or uh, so that work is being done I think in coordination with Flaherty I think is a good Good it'll it'll it, be a partnership. We're okay. still kind of figuring out how okay. that's going to work. Yeah. Okay. And the goal is to start remediation there. So we want to bid the project in January. Okay. And have work begin sometime February or March. And okay. we, we think it's it's about a four to six month timeline to get all of the environmental work complete. Okay. Bert, let's talk about some development in Newport Landing because I think that's where a lot of you where their work stops and yours starts a little bit, right? Um, For sure, yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the, I guess I would touch on a few things. We talked about Flaherty and Collins, and maybe we start there. But, you know, that is a 200-unit multifamily uh, apartment complex. Uh, Flaherty and Collins is a nationally respected um, multifamily developer. We're very, very pleased that they chose to invest here in the port and excited about the project. You know, some of the feedback the, the apartments, well, there's there's 200 units, um, approximately 200 units. They're higher end apartments, so uh, they're going to be closer to the, the the top of the price point currently mm -hmm. in the port, which we think is a good thing, uh, not a bad thing. We've been through a number of their developments. The quality of what they build is really high, but um, the the you know the the overall impact of this would be uh, that we provide some housing that we desperately need. We have, the port has needs throughout the spectrum of our residential market. So single family, multifamily, um, everything in between uh, is a need. So this begins to address some of those issues as well. And, you know, we also see this as being a catalyst for, for other projects later on. I mean, 200 units in a community of this size is a, is a major project. 
Yeah, I mean, do you know the size of some of the other apartment? It, would it be one of the larger apartment complexes in town? It, will, it will be, yep, okay. immediately will be, sure. And, you know, you're talking a 30 plus million dollar investment. So, you know, it's, it's a significant, it has a significant impact on our tax base as well. So what, what made them want to, is this their first project in Laporte? Uh, first in Laporte. Now they have other projects throughout Indiana. I think recently they they around the same time as our project they announced a project in Valparaiso. They're part of the the deal in Valpo with the old Anco facility and Journeyman Distillery, which okay. I know is an exciting one out there. Um, they've done projects in Elkhart, in Mishawaka, Kokomo. We visited Kokomo, um, so I think they they have uh, properties from like Texas to Washington D.C. Um, and, and I know they've got a number of projects in Indiana. It's a really interesting, so the question was what, what got them here in the Yeah, I mean, do you go to them, Bert? Do they come to you? How does this work? Yeah, it happens in different ways. Okay. Almost every project is different. In this instance, we've got, a, we've got an in with the company. Uh, Beth has a colleague that she went to school with that, was, um, that works for them, and that was a really nice connection to, uh, to kind of start the conversation. Um, they weren't the only developer. We had multiple multiple developers looking at this parcel as a potential uh, multifamily development, mm -hmm. which is something that we'll tell you is not only exciting, but it's confidence building for us because it means there's great demand within the market and two companies see that, see that demand in the same way. And real quick, Bert, um, you don't convince them. They do their own studies on these, right? So, you know. They, yeah, it, the, the, the misnomer with this is that, that we have some magic bag of tricks that can, you know, make someone decide that they're going to invest here when they're unwilling to do so. It just doesn't work. They're not, they're not, um, not going to spend $30 million without doing the proper Correct. investigation. Correct. Right? Now, we can help them access the information they need to make a qualified decision. But we can't, you know, we can't pull things out of midair. So, um, you know, that, that's, I think that's something that maybe people in the community at sometimes have this belief that we're just, that, that if we just did this or we just did that, 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 that would impact their decision making when ultimately, um, you know, demographics always pay a, uh, play a major part, uh, kind of what's going on with your, with your market. Um, and then the, the component of is the community desirous of that type of development? Will we work together to try and make something happen? There's, there's a whole lot of, of criteria they use, but ultimately you hit the nail on the head. They've, most of the time, by the time we've, we've, they've got to my office, they've determined whether or not this market is suitable for yeah. their type of development. They have people, right? They Correct. have people, that's their job. Correct. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and Nate, so the other things I would just mention very briefly here, yeah, go ahead. We get, sometimes we get feedback from the community that, man, nothing has happened in Newport Landing. And I take issue with that statement because although it's happened over a longer period of time, you have... Dunkin' Donuts, you've got Starbucks, you've got the Dunes Volleyball Facility, which, you know, if you haven't been by there on a day that they have a tournament, you know, you ought to take a look at that because they pack the parking lot's full, parking lot next door's full, Dunkin' Donuts is full, Starbucks is full. You know, everything in that area is kind of full of people that are utilizing that facility. So we've seen a number of developments occur over the last couple of years. We have a number of new developments that are preparing to occur over the next uh, year and a half, two years. Um, so I, I think that you know, we've seen uh, significant growth in that area, understanding that that growth takes time because of all of the, you know, the issues that Nick and Beth have already mentioned. So, I mean, is it fair to say it hasn't went as quick as even you want, though? Sure. I, I mean, I, if to be honest with you, I'd like to say that everything we touch, you know, will be developed tomorrow. But um, patience is a virtue when it comes to economic development. It does take time. Every project that when, when we you know work together, we, we sort of set out a timeline that we want to see a project occur on. And I think these guys will probably agree that in almost every instance, it takes longer than you know we think it would uh, or should. Um, and that's, that's part of this process. That's part of uh, the decision making that goes into making sure that each project is a good project and that it occurs in the right way and best benefits the city of Laporte. Mm -hmm. So yes, it has taken longer. I mean, I've been in this job for uh, almost 14 years now, and we've been working on Newport Landing the, the entire time. Now, you had a recession in the midst of that, you had changes in administration, and all kinds of other things that affect that timetable, but I can honestly say that we are now at the point where we will be soon transitioning away from that project, meaning that project will be at completion and we'll be moving on to whatever the next project is for the board. Do you, do you think then this, Flaherty project is a, a an important catalyst to get over that kind of development hu developmental hump a little bit and say okay things could really start 
coming in a lot quicker with a big project like that. Yeah, I think the, the Flaherty and Collins, even more so maybe than that, the Flaherty and Collins project is a, a statement as to what we deserve as a community. You know, we you know, often talk about, you know, what, what's, um, you know, what's next for Laporte or what we might be able to get in terms of economic development. Flaherty and Collins is something that, you know, some of the strongest players in, in this market in Indiana have, have gotten deals done with this developer, and, and Laporte is in that, that club as well. So I think it makes a, a very bold statement as to where the trajectory that they see the city of Laporte on. Um, we've always embraced that vision, but you have someone, an outside force, that's kind of looking at us and seeing the same thing that we are, and I think it will have a really positive impact on, on some of the opportunities we have in the Newport Landing area, but really in the broader community as a whole moving forward. Um, I know part of this, part of the struggle and part of the strategy is to make sure that the infrastructure in Newport Landing is, is done well, and the sidewalks and the roads and all of that, um, incorporating Clear Lake, these kind of things. And with the Healthcare Foundation, these kind of things, you've been able to do some really exciting things there. Beth, what do you guys, ha I know some of these projects are kind of, you know, a lot of your uh, brainchild, which again, I will defend and, and celebrate the Chessie Trail uh, over and over again. My kids and I love it. Uh, my dog loves it. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful reuse of space that I didn't know existed, quite frankly, um, which I think is great, you know. But what other kind of things do you want to see in there, or what other kinds of plans do you have for kind of mixed use that you want to, kind of going back to Bert's point, make it also a good place to be? Not just a good place to shop, but a good place to be. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think the, the Chessie is kind of sets the tone. Um, and so we have the first uh, phase of the Chessie built, and then um, we're working on the engineering of the second phase. And once that's done, you'll be able to get from Qantas Teledyne Park um, all the way south to about uh, where Lincoln Way and, and J Street, uh, that curve there. Mm -hmm. um, and so you'll have this uh, multimodal spine that you can connect up with. Is that an engineering term? A multimodal spine? Planning, engineering, it, it crosses <laughs> boundaries. I think I've heard Bert uh, throw it around a couple times too. You know? Multimodal spine? Yes. It's getting, it's getting deep in here now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that's an important piece because uh, that connects the neighborhoods and uh, downtown into what's happening in Newport and it connects uh, our parks and our lakes with that development. Um, and so in Newport, we're kind of, we're trying to connect to the Chessie that is already built there um, through, uh, we're gonna have a, a, a loop trail all the way around Clear Lake, which is already uh, partly constructed. So we have the Clear Lake Trail that goes from, um, uh, Essentially, on the on the uh, be on the south side, right? Yeah, kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. the south southeast yeah. um, edge of Clear Lake. So uh, eventually, it'll go all the way around. Um, you say eventually, like how soon is that going to be done? Probably. Well, we're going to do some engineering of that as part of uh, a planning uh, grant that we got from the Healthcare Foundation, um, and then uh, some trailheads and uh, connectors are going to be built uh, next summer and next fall. Connectors of the trails. Yeah, so right now, um, so Holocker Trail, uh, Holocker Drive, um, will be a pedestrian thoroughfare uh, at some point. Um, we're going to connect that so that all the folks that want to use the Clear Lake Trail will have that as an access point um, to connect with Chessie. And, uh, and the Clear Lake Trails. So that's all going in very soon. But we also have uh, improvements to the Lakeshore planned, um, just uh, enhancing access for fishing. Um, we have a boardwalk that's going to be going in, so that'll be uh, good for just viewing wildlife and sure. strolling and, and, and enjoying I, and the I, lake. Knowing you guys, especially n n Nick and Beth, who do a lot of this specific project, I know for you, and I, one of the criticisms I've read and I've heard from friends and is there's a concern that, you know, you're, you're gonna make it a worse place for fishermen, or, but really for you guys, it's to actually create an environment that's better for Clear Lake and the enjoyment of the lake, correct? I mean, 
Yeah, the, the plan for the shoreline uh, are enhancements so that it is uh, improved biodiversity, improved uh, quality of uh, water, um, uh, you know, the plants and the animals there. Are you saying you want Clear Lake to be clearer? Um, actually, less clear would actually be healthier, I think. <laughs> um, so, you know, get things growing in there um, and uh, more folks using it will be great. Um, so, for, for example, when we put in the Clear Lake Trail, which was a conversion of Clear Lake Boulevard into a one-way street and a multimodal trail. That's on the southeast side there, the trail yeah. that you built yeah. this and, last year. And we, I think we got criticism because you used to be able to literally drive your car off the side of the road and fish from your window, sure. which is appealing to some people, but at the same time, the more you're doing that and the more that people are doing that, the the edge of the lake is really impacted. So you have vehicles which drip oils and you have you know, all these different things just getting kind of pulled into the lake. You don't have vegetation able to establish. There's, there's a number of issues associated with having vehicles, basically vehicles interacting with the lake Absolutely. versus fishermen interacting with the lake. So we, we did provide for three, three parking areas. The largest of the parking areas uh, is under contract and will start in the spring. The other two parking areas Can you say are, where those are or no? Yeah, so there's one at McClung Road, there's one just past Furnace Street, and then there's one kind of in the Detroit Street area. So they're okay. kind of distributed along that section. Um, we, we want people to access the lake. We want people to enjoy the lake. We want it hopefully done in a way that also protects the lake so that people can enjoy it. Will you be putting up any benches or anything like that or? Yeah, and I think um, Beth alluded to the, the whole locker kind of we, we talk about it as kind of a pedestrian promenade with bikes. I think that's going to be the greatest opportunity for, for more benches. So you're uh, talking about, if I just in case people, uh, I know you guys work on the streets yeah. and the streets come very natural to you, but sometimes I have to think about it. You're talking about the area in front of the, um, the uh, amphitheater there, right? Uh, so that'd, there? Tru that'd be Truesdale. Oh, so, so really we have three areas around Clear Lake that will have a, a loop trail. Not okay. a lot of communities have that opportunity. We have Clear Lake Boulevard, which basically runs from Detroit Street to McClung Road. Yeah. And then um, Truesdale is from McClung Road kind of into the into the development area up to Holocker. Holocker is interesting. I, I know I personally got a lot of a lot of criticism when, when we move forward with this this plan, but Holocker is kind of the big concrete roadway along the edge of Clear Lake. That is, that is not a natural feature. So that roadway was put in place so that Alice Chalmers could fill in the lakes. So that was kind of their boundary, that was their access, and then they filled in everything else. So um, we're, we really are trying to recapture some of that, like I said, natural capital, and trying to make that not just a, an industrial hull route, but something that allows people to access the lakes and access the, the natural beauty of Clear Lake and, and enhance the natural beauty of Clear Lake. So is that gonna just be a trail or will that be a, a one-way road as well or a uh, whole locker or? No vehicles, <coughs> um, okay. so it'll be uh, pedestrians, cyclists, uh, skaters, things like that. Um, but we also uh, envision uh, more amenities there than around the rest of the trail. So more seating, more landscape, um, so make that really the feature uh, of that, the trail. The featured side of Clear Lake yeah. will be, or the most prominent yeah, side. Yeah, the, the most heavily, uh, most investment is gonna go there. Um, and we would expect the heaviest use. And there are, so we've already, we already have the first parking area under contract that's on the south end. We have a parking area planned for the north end and we have a parking area planned for the center. Um, just beyond the roundabout in Newport Landing. So if you go, if you would go straight, which you can't do right now, uh, kind of in that area, we're looking at some additional parking. So we want people to be able to get there and enjoy it. That's that's really our goal is is trying to create um, something that people can go out and get active and enjoy. And that's why Healthcare Foundation's been so generous and and supporting a lot of our efforts is because we're we're trying to create a catalyst for activity and we're trying to. Uh, kind of reinvigorate and energize a, a lake that has been, um, with the exception of Fox Park and the amphitheater, of course. Um, 
So we, we want to make sure that that lake, which is in such close proximity, it really is in our downtown, um, is, is highlighted as, as the gem of a natural asset that we, we have. Um, so I'll have you back next December. We're going to do updates on all these. But what do you want to have done on all of that, Beth, by, the, by this time next year? Like in all of those things that we've talked about, what's on your agenda to get it done before this point of next year? Well, the, the progress is incremental, but we will have, uh, I think, a trailhead, which will include parking and some amenities, uh, picnic areas, signage, things like that. We'll have a boardwalk constructed um, right near that trailhead. We'll have uh, a piece of trail that connects the Chessy to um, Holocker. So uh, even though Holocker won't be improved yet, you'll be able to make that connection, not walking on any roads, uh, safe from cars, uh, all the way through Newport Landing and around uh, half a clear lake. So you can expect that. And, and then additionally, we had talked earlier about the cleanup. So um, you can also anticipate the, the cleanup of what we call phase 2A, which is kind of the, the prime area just on the other side of Clear Lake Boulevard um, to be complete. You'll not just clean up where um, Flaherty and Collins is going. You're going to clean up that whole area then? Yeah, from the roundabout to Truesdale gotcha. between Clear Lake Boulevard and, and Clear Lake. So. And assuming everything goes well, we're uh, in the running right now for a, a tax credit, or Flaherty and Collins is in the running for a tax credit um, that makes the project financially possible. Um, it's uh, through the state. And assuming everything goes well with that, we'll also see... Um, some movement on the <coughs> project. Great. Uh, let's let's shift gears a little bit here. Bert, um, you're, you're the old dog here. You, you've been working here the longest. Um, in el economic development, the longest, for 14 years, I think you said. Correct. What's changed in 14 years in Laporte? What do you, what do you see changing? Um, and it might not be specifically to Laporte, just maybe economic development in America, but what are you seeing is different now than it was you can maybe even go back to your time in Portage and things when you started. So, you know, one of the easy areas to identify, you know, change or focus is kind of our downtown area. Um, you know, I like to refer to it as, and, and I don't, you know, you can, or we can argue dates a little bit, but in a previous time, downtowns were the popular retail area of your city. That's where people shopped and all your restaurants were located. And, you know, the American consumer has changed dramatically and we expect now to get into our car and to drive up to the front door of whatever store we're going to shop in, go in and get what we need, get back in the car, go down the road to the next store. And so dedicated parking and, and the, the, you know, has created this, this major problem in downtowns. And downtowns are just typically not used for retail development anymore because, again, you can't do that. You know, mm -hmm. in, in downtown you have to park and you walk to the stores and you walk, you know, then you walk back to your car. So we've had to make a major change in strategy in the downtown area to figure out how we put that space um, back into use, right? How we, how we help that. Less than five years ago, we had 70% vacancy in our downtown, which is a, a major, major issue. I mean, just the deferred maintenance alone there is, is extremely problematic. And so you end up with all these buildings that are beautiful and have historic character and, and kind of create the aesthetic of our downtown but they're almost unmanageable from a financial perspective because they haven't been taken care of. And so the, the dollars it would cost to upgrade them to a point where they could be put back into use are greater than any appraisal would ever support. And so you can't take financing on any type of building like that. And so the only scenario that would present itself would be if someone came in and said, I have hundreds of thousands of dollars to just throw into this deal, regardless of what I can finance, because I want to see it done. And it just didn't happen, and so you ended up with all of these buildings that were just continuing to get worse and worse and worse. And really, a lot of them are being ran by small businesses too, right? Correct, the ones yeah. that even correct. Are, maybe, they don't, maybe they don't even have the financial capability to do some of the things. Yep. And so, you know, that's one area that I think we've seen a dramatic shift. The, the city's strategy at this point is to um, the UEA, if you're familiar with that organization. What is UEA? Uh, the Urban Enterprise Association, led by Mike Riley, who's the president, I think has done uh, an, a magnificent job of investing significant resources in the downtown. You have um, the, the building that RQAW is now housed in, um, the 
uh, Bare Bones or Burnham Breweries restaurant that's getting ready to open. And then almost- When does that open? Uh, should be January, okay. February. Um, and then a variety of other buildings that, you know, I think anyone who walks downtown says, oh, you know, I, I see the new paint and awnings and things. Those are all grants that are being supported by the Urban Enterprise Association. And they're making those investments to help change that dynamic on the financial side, to make these, these buildings more viable again. And so it leads to this strategy of, you know, maybe not focusing as much on retail, but looking at the downtown as the ideal place for restaurants, for unique restaurants, for service providers, uh, you know, in the hope of creating that foot traffic again, which will ultimately lead to additional retail opportunities at some point in the future. Now, all of that is is kind of what's going on right now. I would, my own personal belief, and, and I know it's, an, it's a hot button topic, but I would suggest it to you that I'm a firm believer in for us to continue to see our downtown, you know, sort of reshaped and, and grow. You know, we really have to take a hard look at how we remove the truck traffic from that area. We, we reroute truck traffic around the port. Um, you know, oftentimes it, people have varying perspectives on that topic, and I understand that. Um, but, you know, it, it really creates, uh, people say, well, we've got a parking problem downtown. There's no quantity issue of parking spaces. It's the quality of parking that's available that, that's problematic. Anyone who has gotten out, has parked, parallel parked on Lincoln Way and gotten out with a truck in the lane directly next to them, moving 30, 40 miles an hour, I think will understand the idea that I that's, get right with Jesus every time. It's, it's an uncomfortable yeah. situation. And it leads people to just choose not to do that. And so instead, they'll go shop somewhere else or go to a different restaurant that they're maybe more comfortable you know, parking. And so people say, well, gosh, if you reroute the truck traffic away from downtown, isn't that going to hurt your local businesses? You know, I would challenge you. I've never seen a semi-parked shopping or getting a haircut in downtown or using one of our restaurants. I've never seen that. I don't know where you would park if you had a semi. I guess you'd have to find 10 spots you know, all together that you could park. So I, I think that argument really doesn't hold a lot of water. Um, and, and so you know, we want to be responsible in how we develop our community. But those downtowns across America that we all have been to, that people like to be in and like to spend their money and spend their time, they all have a pretty consistent uh, atmosphere. And that's a comfort you know, for people, pedestrians, comfort for people who are, who are utilizing those, those businesses and those spaces. And you, know, you couple that with another aspect that is it's starting to boom for us, and I think it could be an even bigger growth area, is living downtown. You know, a lot of people coming out of college expect that type of, or like that type of living arrangement. So we have a pretty significant list of people who are looking for housing opportunities in our downtown right now, um, that I think it, that can be something that continues to help mm -hmm. us grow that area. But again, you know, personal belief here, and uh, we, we have to figure out a way to address the, the, the issue we have with, with sort of how commerce occurs throughout our downtown. And that's a, that's a really a 10 to 20 year solution, isn't it? I mean, the, uh, if we're talking about a bypass or things like this, this is a, those are, that's a big dollar amount of money, but I think it has to start now in order to get this done in 10 to 15 years. Yeah, it's, it's, tough, it's tough, Nate, because you're exactly right, but again, you know, if you push it down the road, it just never gets started. And I'd like to think that at some point, you know, my kids are, are growing up here, will live here, you know, that we would be setting the stage for a, a Laporte that is, you know, a better place than even it is today. And, and I do believe that that's an important component of that. And I, I, you know, again, not to get too much into it, but I, I, I agree with you. I, I am of sympathetic to those, especially I've, I've heard from friends who own some businesses downtown that do have some concerns. Um, but, you know, I, I look at other communities uh, that have went to a bypass, and we're not talking a bypass that's 30 miles around, you know, <laughs> that really takes you around. We're talking, you know, a mile away. Um, but you look at a community like Valparaiso, and uh, they have not only survived, they've thrived with a, a bypass going around their downtown area. So, um, I think sometimes people equate bypasses going around with smaller communities like Rolling Prairie. Do you know what I mean? Where you, they did Highway 20 and it, it did kill a small little community. But I, I think Laporte's got enough of a economy, you know, inter, um, intertwined with it that I don't think it's going to matter. But uh, well, there's there's you know there's other aspects of it too that are not strictly bypass. There you know there are other things that you can do that you know can help you know, encourage people to use other routes. And, and I know, um, 
again, we don't want to spend all our time talking about that one particular issue, but I think you're right. I think the, the misnomer in all of this is that there seems to be a perception that if you put a bypass in that it, it's crippling or it does some sort of damage because somebody knows about some community that that happened in across Indiana or across the nation. But I think you're, you're, you referenced a couple of the communities that are shining stars. I mean, what Valparaiso did in their downtown is, is pretty amazing. I mean, I think you, you would be hard pressed to find another community around here that's done a better job of uh, recreating, you know, how their downtown looks and how it's utilized. When we talk about 10 to 15 years, I, I think sometimes people forget how much Valparaiso has changed in 15, to, you know, 20 years. Um, growing up in this area, it wasn't what it is today. So changes and, and decisions that economic development people make um, can make big, you know, big uh, changes in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And just, I have to add yeah. my two cents because I'm an engineer and transportation is part of what I do. When, when I look at our transportation system, we, look, we look at two things. We look at mobility and accessibility. So we talked about the local tracks program and having an overpass. That's going to greatly improve mobility. You're going to be able to move from A to B very efficiently. When you do something like that, there are you know a couple entities that may be a little bit more cut off. So the accessibility is at the expense of the mobility. In Laporte, our main corridors are controlled by the state, so they're all state highways. In in that happening, we give up a lot of control over what happens on those. If if you think about it, uh, you can't cross Pine Lake Avenue north of Weller. So the Weller Truesdale intersection is the furthest north pedestrian crossing of Pine Lake Avenue. So you have beautiful lakes and beautiful parks and neighborhoods, and nobody can get safely from one side to the other. We're solving that partially with our Chessie Trail and having a, a hawk signal, so a pedestrian activated hybrid beacon there. Um, but we've, we've given so much to INDOT in allowing them to, to have the state highways to move vehicles quickly through the city that we've kind of lost track of that accessibility in some ways. So our community is less accessible because we're offering mobility to, to folks outside of our community. So something like, a, 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 I'm not allowed to call it a bypass, economic an corridor. economic development oh, corridor. Been, have you been talking to Lee Morris? Because <laughs> that's what he got yeah. on me for calling it Yeah, I'm not, not allowed too. to call it that. Um, but you look at a project like that, and what it does is it allows us to take back control of uh, our roadway assets in the community and to develop them in a way that supports our community um, and, and hopefully doesn't hinder those other things. We don't want to hinder um, a, a truck's ability to get from Kingsbury Industrial Park to 94. We don't want to hinder that, but we can do some things to, um, to support our community and, and make sure they're successful too. And, and hopefully if we can push this project forward over time, we'll have that and, and have a thriving downtown. Uh, Beth, you focus a lot on downtown, so downtown projects I know are, are a passion of yours. Um, what do you think some of the strengths are in Laporte's downtown, and what are some of the challenges? For I'm talking not like just, or I'm not even talking over in Newport. I'm talking specific mm -hmm. downtown corridor. I think Bert hit on some of that. I think the strengths are uh, kind of historic fabric, the architecture that's there, um, the fact that at least currently we have a pretty low vacancy rate in our downtown, um, but like all the bones are there. Um, so that's uh, a good starting place to work from. Now the challenge is uh, what Bert mentioned is the deferred uh, maintenance issues throughout the downtown. So in the second and, and third levels of many of the buildings, um, there may not be electricity, there may not be gas, heat, um, there may be, you know, populations of, of pigeons. Um, so the, some of the buildings have serious uh, issues that cost a lot of money to uh, fix in order to make them usable for anything uh, more than what they're being used for right now. So in order to attract um, more of the types of uh, maybe restaurants, services, um, 
you know, some retail that we'd like to see in the downtown. Um, we need to have investment, and I think that's gonna come, uh, we've seen public sector investment through the Urban Enterprise Association and through the Re Redevelopment Commission in the grants that they've done for facades um, and in the, the plaza, um, uh, the community coming together, all the business partners uh, throughout our community donating to make that happen. So we have need public and we have need private uh, investment in the downtown. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, I think we're poised to turn a corner. Um, there's you know been a lot of sales recently, um, and uh, we happen to know that we're going to. Uh, have a, a lot of help from the Urban Enterprise Association, hopefully in the, in the future, um, to continue the work that they've started uh, with the improvements to buildings. So I think that's kind of the approach we need to take uh, to address the the issues that we're facing. Uh, Bert, did the UEA was that their project with the Burnham guys? Yeah, it is, uh, or it was, and was. still is. Yeah. 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 So um, you know, I, and I love this model. Um, so we, that's what I was wondering. Are you going to be doing that again or not? Yeah, we will. Um, so we're, they're focused on the last couple of years. Each uh, summer, construction season, we've done uh, five or six what we call 80-20 grants, which are painting and awnings. The UEA shoulders 80% of the cost and the, the building owner 20%. And that includes like the tuck pointing, the things you need to get ready for paint. So we've done five or six for the last three years. We're going to do another five or six this year. Um, those are already booked. We have, you know, people are applying for those years in advance, um, which is great the way it should be. Now, on top of that, beginning of 2017, the UEA acquired uh, a building, the one that, that Burnham now owns, and renovated it to what we would call like a vanilla box. So we took care of the major structural issues. We took care of electrical and, and, and all of the things necessary to put a building, which if you'd been in that building, you'll be the, I think you'd be the first to say it's really rough shape. Well, you got the pigeons out. You got all the really, you know, um, right. important right. things done. Right. right, exactly. And then, you know, the agreement that we have was that, that Burnham will operate for a five-year period, a minimum of a five-year period uh, within the space. They would invest um, their own money to finish the build out, to redo the apartment upstairs, to do the kitchen and all of the things necessary to turn it into the restaurant that they you know the proposal that they put forth, and uh, and and we we had a bid you know process. So we received numerous proposals on companies who would like to operate in the space, and there were some great ones. And, and ultimately, we selected Burnham. But, um, but yeah, that that was the you know the UEA the the total project. I think the UEA, you know, all in all has you know two hundred thousand plus dollars in that building when it's all said and done. Um, Burnham's going to have a, a pretty similar amount. And, uh, and we think it's gonna be a, a great attraction. I've, I've been through the space just a couple weeks ago. It looks great. Um, they're ready to kind of finishing their kitchen up right now. And, and I think they'll be open you know, early in 2019. But you know, that's a model that I'm, I, I'm a big fan of. Again, that building, I can tell you from the financial side, that building would have never been redeveloped um, with, with strictly private money. It just wouldn't make sense. People don't just give away money, and, and I wouldn't expect it to, to occur in that instance, and that's why the UEA getting involved in the way they did becomes so important. So will you do it again? I think we will. Um, it's, a, it's a challenge, right? I, and the UEA board, if you were to be, if they were sitting here today, they would tell you that we maybe didn't realize how costly and time um, would be involved in, in redoing that. Um, but I do think it's something we would consider doing again. We did a, a, a similar situation with RQAW, although they, they maintained ownership. They actually purchased the building and the UEA offset that with, uh, with a grant. But I think, yes, we would, uh, we would consider doing it again. And furthermore, I think the UEA would always be open to considering if someone has a really good concept and they're willing to put their, their own money into a deal, we'd love to talk to them on how we can make that happen. Yeah. Um, but again, key key so there is listening, or you know, if they have an idea, come and talk to you. I yeah, mean, absolutely. Yeah. Key yeah. key being that it's not we're not it's not a it's not a freebie, right? Yep. So you have to invest your own money in in order to make this work. But absolutely, if there's any ideas out there and people who have things that they're uh, considering, come talk to us for sure. Um, what about um, what do you think? Why? How, how do we attract? 
So I've got, you know, Nick's from LaPorte. Um, I, I, Bert, you're from Portage, I think, right? Correct. Beth, you're from Bloomington. Bloomington. Um, Nick and I, I'm sure, graduated with lots of people, friends of ours that have moved away um, and didn't move back. If you were talking to some of these people, some of these young people that are going to college, what would you say is a good reason for them to come back to LaPorte? So I'm happy to start. I, yeah, please um, do. You know, I've, I've lived here um, for the 14 years that I've worked here now, and, and that's, you know, quite a long time. But um, for me, my family lives here because I think this is a great place to raise kids. Uh, we have a wonderful school corporation who, uh, you know, I'm, my kids are in school, uh, and I think the world of what Mark Francisconi and his team is doing with our school corporation, um, the quality of life here is something that we expect. Um, you know, to raise our family. And when, when we purchased our home here, you know, one of the aspects of Laporte that people look past all the time is the cost of living here is significantly less than even our neighboring counties, which is a huge advantage. I was able to buy a home here when I was 22 years old, when, you know, I'd been living in an apartment in, in Valparaiso, and I ended up buying a home and paid less for my home than I did in my, in my rent you know, at my apartment. So the cost of living is, is a huge advantage that I think people really need to pay attention to. Um, but uh, I, I think, you know, you, the, the overall quality of, of the experience of, of raising a family here in the port is something that's very, very attractive to me. And I think it was a huge selling point. And I think I was going to say quality of life is, is the big one. I think if we can continue to develop a kind of a, a well-rounded quality of life. I mean, we, we have some gaps right now. Um, I think people are working to address that. We're working to try and fill the retail gap. We're working to, to do some more with residential, things like that. Um, you can buy a house on the lake and then enjoy a lake lifestyle. You can buy a house in one of the historic areas and enjoy you know, a beautiful historic home. You can buy a house in, in any one of our really great neighborhoods and, and just enjoy a, a really low cost of living and, and, a, and a high quality of life. Um, I think we need to continue to to let people know that you have that opportunity. Um, I don't know that a lot of a lot of young young families realize that uh, you can spend about half as much on a home and and still have um, as many, if not more, amenities for your family to to thrive in this community as as a lot of our neighboring communities. Les, do you have anything to add? I think you guys did a great job with your answers. <laughs> All right, just a couple more questions and we'll be done. Um, if you, so we'll have some people watching this and listening to the podcast. And what you do um, every day, and you, you get feedback either in city council meetings or uh, board of works meetings, or you get emails or people stopping by. What's maybe a misconception, or is there something that you would just like to address publicly and say, okay, maybe this isn't very accurate and I want to kind of correct the rec record on some of this. Is there anything there that you guys would like to address as people who are working in economic development? Because I think it's an area that a lot of people either don't understand or don't always have the full story on because it is a multifaceted but also often a multi-year project that you guys are working on. So is there anything that you guys would like to kind of talk about or misconceptions or something you'd like to say? Well, I, I, think, I think it's important for people to realize, you know, I. I grew up in this community. I love this community. I live in this community, and I'm I'm here to serve it. I don't. I'm not the city engineer because I have to be. Uh, I have a lot of opportunities. I've I've <laughs> lived other other places, and I and I choose to be here, um, and I choose to be in the role I'm in, and and I've you know made some life decisions in order to make that possible. So I think I'd like the community to know that we are here as a as a resource to them. We are here. To, to try and make sure that um, if they have a, a, a concern or if they have you know, a, something that they, they believe needs to happen, come to us and, and let us know. Um, my office is open, my you know, email's on, on our city website. Um, we, we are a resource to the community and the more, um, it, if we spend all of our time kind of, I don't know, in, engaging in online discussions or anything like that, we're not gonna get our work done. We're very small, um, kind of a, a small workforce as far as cities go. I mean, my engineering department is really three people. Do you want to brag about them real quick for them? Uh, Lisa Biddle, she's a project manager. She works the front desk. Margaret Dickerson, she's a project manager. She works on 
most of our infrastructure projects, sidewalks and whatnot, leases, focuses on city facilities, and then myself. So that's our engineering department. Um, I mean, we're doing a lot of projects. We're um, kind of managing a, quite a bit of construction every year and really with a very, very, very small staff compared to, you know, a lot of our neighboring communities would have, you know, double the people doing about the same, if not less work. So. Um, I know we, we do work hard and we want to serve and that's why we're in the position we're in. So let us know what you need and communicate and we will be as communicative and uh, as helpful as we possibly can be to, to make sure you know, everybody is successful and, and that uh, issues are addressed to, to the best of our ability within financial constraints. So, so mine would be centered around the incentive process and the incentives that are used locally uh, it's the it's the least understood aspect of economic development in my experience again we go back to perception within the community and and oftentimes I think people allow that to drive what they believe to be you know their knowledge about incentive um, so in the state of Indiana you know it's 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 very clear and very uh, I, I love the the general philosophy of the state which is to uh, make the cost of doing business as low as possible, and then you don't have to incentivize at, at such great levels. Um, and the incentives are performance-based, right? So any incentive at the state, until you create jobs, you don't get the incentive. It's that simple. What do you mean by incentives? So um, oftentimes, uh, you're, you're talking about two general programs at the local level. We'll exclude the UEA because that that's a it's a connected but, but, but different incentive program. But the two that most people are familiar with are tax abatement, which a better term would be tax phase-in, um, and then tax increment financing, which is actually the reverse of tax abatement. Which uh, is TIF. Really? Yeah, yeah, exactly, which is the, um, the, the capturing of an income stream for bonding purposes, money up front as opposed to phasing in taxes over time. But at the, at the state level, um, you know, it's generally credits that are based, based on employment. At the local level, it's based on pro your effect on the property tax, as well as connected, you know, quality of jobs or quantity of jobs that are created. So I hear often when, when tax abatement is brought up, the first thing that comes out of many people's mouth is you're giving away money, which is couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, no money ever changes hands in, in that way. And so that's the, the first thing. And then beyond that, if the company does not choose to locate here or purchases that piece of equipment or buys that building or bu um, builds that building, there would be no tax to phase in, right? So you're, you're using the incentives to, uh, to assist with the decision-making capability or that company's decision to locate here. And so, you know, I'll tell you that every single community uh, on every single deal offers incentives. If someone is telling you different, they're either not a practitioner, they're not doing the job, or they're just flat out lying. Um, it's, a, it's an accepted methodology, it's done in every community. Now other states do different things than Indiana. In Illinois, they, they do cut checks you know, to, to locate a company within their state. We don't do that in, in Indiana. Um, but there are, there are different incentive programs in other states, but here at the local level, you know, we utilize these incentive programs to, uh, to attract investment into our community. I think we do that in a very, very conservative manner. Um, and there's never, you know, the, the perception that we're, you know, we're writing checks or that companies are experiencing these benefits without performing is just not accurate. Um, it's not the way it's done. And, and, um, and frankly, it doesn't, it's, you're not, they're not even taxed in that way. So it, it's, um, it's just a misunderstanding that I would, I would address because I think we get that feedback often, which is, oh, the local government is giving away money. And that's just not accurate. Going back to your original point then that you made at the beginning about placemaking. So if everyone's offering many of these same incentives then, right? There's a company of 100 people wanting to lo relocate in this area and, you know, Valparaiso and Warsaw and Goshen and Eagle Port are all trying to get it. We're all offering the same incentives. That's why I assume then creating the best place that they want to live is vitally important then. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Now the, the criteria we remember that companies are, are, are run by people and individuals have different perspectives on things. So, you know, we use a criteria in, in of the you know, let's say the top ten factors that influence that decision making. And for each company they're different. Some 
you know, the, the number one is just the cost, the overall cost to operate within that community. Some it's, are, is there good school corporations that my children and my employees' children will go to? Will go to? Others, are there, the are there the restaurants and stores that we like to eat and shop in? Um, others are, can we find the right type of housing? You know, there's a variety of factors that, that influence that decision making, um, but it's, you know, it's, it's different from each company to, from company to company. Now, we do have the ability to, uh, to negotiate or to, you know, create, uh, get more aggressive on the incentive side so we can increase some of those percentages and offer more savings for one company versus another if they fit within the, the criteria or the strategy that we're trying to employ. But yeah, we're all working off generally the same, the same programs. Um, so it becomes vitally important to create that quality of life that, you know, that, um, that makes those companies want to choose to be here. Now, rhetorically, I'll tell you, uh, or pragmatically, I'll tell you one um, quick story. It was years and years and years ago. We, w we had a company in town for four or five days, and they had chosen a site um, that they wanted to open a uh, manufacturing facility on. And, you know, we had went through the entire process of looking at the workforce and the demographics, the cost. They had negotiated a price on the building. I mean, we were, we were pretty much at that last stage where they kind of give you the good to go, let's move forward. And ultimately, they, we didn't get the project and they went to another community, and the issue was, uh, at that time, again, 10 plus years ago now, the, the CEO and his wife had been in the community and had looked, started looking at homes and restaurants and shopping and things that were important to them, and they just couldn't find it here. They weren't satisfied that we had what their expectation was, and ultimately, they, they pulled that deal and they went to another community. And, you know, we try and address that. We're doing all kinds of things to improve our community, but you know, it can be something so simple as, as that, that, that really impacts a, you know, hundreds of million dollar decision. There was an article, and I can post it on our episode guide, but uh, that uh, our, one of our content people, Kelly Tenger, sent to us, uh, sent to me. It was essentially about uh, cities that have a Starbucks in it um, have these certain economic indicators as well, and that, you know, you might not shop at Starbucks, but it does say something about your economic indicators as a community. It's, you know? it's so true. I mean, it, it's as simple as people view, if you have a Starbucks, you're considered a rich community, and if you do not, you're considered a poor community. There's nothing that goes beyond perception there, but that really is something that you well, have to- Well, perception matters. Absolutely. absolutely. Yep. What about you? You just teed it up perfect. Thank because, you. Because um, I just want to change the perceptions that uh, have been long held in Laporte, um, I think uh, I for the grant that we were working on through the state um, for the Flaherty project, we had to uh, explore a lot of the loss um, that was caused by uh, leave, uh, Alice Chalmers leaving, American Home Foods leaving, and um, I think some of the taste of that is left in. Uh, the mouths of the community, and um, sometimes it sours the ability to see all the, the beautiful things that are here. And um, coming with an outside perspective, I've been here for four years working with the city, um, I see the beautiful parks and the lakes and the historic avenues and the downtowns and the neighborhoods and the fact that we're all connected by sidewalks and we have beautiful trees throughout uh, the city and we're very compact and walkable and bikeable and there's just so much to work from here um, there's so much that makes us special and the challenges that we have are things that they're not that special they're they're challenges that communities throughout northwest indiana the state the the midwest everywhere throughout the world face you know uh post-industrialization dealing with brownfields, um, dealing with disinvestment in, in downtowns. These are common problems, and uh, we've got a good, solid team of people that are really invested in, in addressing these problems and um, helping Laporte be the best it can be. It's, um, I, 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 we have another podcast called The Summer Friends Podcast, and I had uh, Adam Wilson from Wilson's Barbershop on it. And uh, he's from California, but he kind of, like you're saying, Beth, uh, from outside of the area coming in here to open a business, and he looks at 
many of these things differently than I do because I've, I've seen Pine Lake my whole life. I've seen Stone Lake my whole life. And from somebody coming into a community that says, we have three lakes within a city, that's amazing. You know what I mean? You, you kind of get reminded a little bit that, you know what, it might not be as bad as you think it is just because you're here and in the midst of it and it hasn't changed, everything hasn't changed so much for you. Uh, talk to somebody that might be a little bit newer in a community that's doing well in a business and they might be able to tell you um, that it, it, there, there, are, there are opportunities but there's also a, a sense of uniqueness to this community that you can succeed and succeed uh, remarkably. Like, yeah. I still remember, you know, coming, I had never been to LaPorte when I took the, the job with Gledsey, you know, and I, I remember driving in and passing Pine Lake and then hitting the overpass and seeing the downtown, and I remember just sitting in awe that, that this was here, this place was here, and that I had, you know, who grew up, I grew up in Northwest Indiana, I was, you know, just down the road, that I had never been here and, and you know, felt very lucky that I got the opportunity to work here and to live here. It really is a, an impressive place. All right, well, we'll end with this, guys. I know you are busy. Um, I would love to, we've got, I've got a thousand more questions for you, um, but I have one more question, and that's it, and we'll end. Uh, we'll have to do this again uh, next December, and we'll get to some more of these questions. Um, but we always end every episode with this one question. What brings you hope? Nicholas, what brings you hope? I, I think... I think working with Bert and Beth and uh, Mayor Krentz, and we've just had a, a lot of opportunity to to collaborate, and and I see a lot of hope in um, that the positive attitude and the outlook on on what we can continue to do to make our community great. And I think we're we're every day working towards that, and um, brings me a lot of hope to to see kind of the little little things happening here and there as as we continue to move forward. What about you, Bert? What, what brings you hope? So I, I you know, I'm uh, as an economic developer, I think we're always looking towards the future. The next um, year in, in Laporte is a big one. Um, we've got a whole bunch of things that, that are in progress, that are going to be built, that are going to be announced here. Um, when? Bert. Soon. Patience. I, yeah, patience. But we've, we've got some things that uh, I, I feel comfortable saying the first quarter of next year will be out there. We'll be... And those aren't small things. Those are large-scale projects that uh, I think will be very exciting for the community. And so, you know, couple that with the work that's already been done in the downtown in Newport Landing and Thomas Rose, and that to me gives me a, a great deal of hope that we're in for uh, a, a very strong next few years. What about you, City Planner Beth? Well, I'd agree with what my my uh, coworkers here uh, said, but then I'd also say, and this isn't a shameless plug, but Anytime I'm feeling down, especially in the summer, if I need a little boost of hope, I will go to the Jackson Street Garden. <laughs> uh, now, you, now, you're, now you're sucking up there, but I'm not. Go it's, on. It's completely true because that was a very challenging project. Uh, right. when, when I first uh, started with the city, um, it was a, well, was it still a parking lot? The vision. On Google Maps, it's still a parking lot. Yeah. So, so uh, the vision was a community garden, and uh, we were trying and trying and trying, and just it wasn't happening. And um, we got the right people involved, uh, and that was the PAC Center. And um, it's just a beautiful place. I love uh, it as an asset for, for downtown, and just the whole you know, the growing and the renewal and the life that it brings and the, the garden program for the kids that's there and the way it brings the neighbors together and the tomatoes and uh, the cosmos that are all around the edge of the... Uh, you really do spend some time in there, it, huh? It's, it's gorgeous. And um, so that's, uh, that's one of the things mm -hmm. I could go on. There's lots of specific projects give me hope, but um, that's a favorite of mine. Yeah, and, you know, uh, to, to kind of echo a little bit of what Nick said about, you know, being there for the community. You guys have been great partners for us, and I know I've um, adopted the, and I'm, I'm embracing the nickname Pesky Pastor Nate, um, but you guys, you guys are great partners, and so I encourage anybody that has a project in mind um, th that also is open. I mean, I, I hope nobody comes into any partnership demanding. Uh, we come into a project wanting to collaborate, and so, um, and when, you get the right people in a room together, you get the right people around a table together, 
uh, great projects can happen. And so, um, and that doesn't mean oftentimes we even have to bring in people to Laporte. We've got people in Laporte that I know have good ideas that um, have uh, money that they can invest um, and, and create a better community for all of us to live in um, that I think is going to be better than the, um, what people think is the, uh, ep or the kind of the big days of Laporte when all was Chalmers was. I think we can reclaim those and even have better days in the future. So um, I want to thank you for watching and listening to the podcast. Uh, thank you to uh, Becky Crane for making our Christmas cookies today for our discussion over dessert. They were delicious. Thank you. Um, yes, go ahead. Help yourself. Uh, thank you to our intern, Grace Crane, who is running all of our video stuff and did a lot of uh, behind-the-scenes content stuff. Thank you to Kelly Tanger, who uh, also did content stuff and gave me more questions that I could ask, and I wish I could get to them because there's so many good ones. Um, uh, we didn't even talk about the hospitals. We didn't do any of that. Um, and uh, also thank you to Alyssa Lingle, who does all of our graphic work, and everyone else that helps put this on. Again, uh, be checking our uh, discussionoverdinner.com and our Facebook. Um, very soon we'll have our dates announced for the first quarter of next year. We invite you to State Street Community Church uh, to attend our discussion over dinner, and it'll be a lot of fun. So thanks for watching and listening, and we'll see you again soon.